The talk on the Indian airwaves is of war with Pakistan again. Last week, a suicide bomber killed 40 Indian soldiers in Kashmir. A militant group based in Pakistan, Jesh and Mohammed, has claimed responsibility for the worst such attack in more than 70 years. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government in New Delhi has accused the Pakistani government of backing the group, and many Indian news outlets have gone further, calling for a crackdown on so-called anti-nationals at home who they describe as terrorist sympathizers. The social media side of this story also deserves scrutiny. Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp, the messaging there can be out of control and ugly. We've reported on the Pakistani media before, and we will again. But with India just months away from a general election, we're focusing on that side of this story. The stakes were already high for the ruling BJP and its primary challenger, the Congress Party. The bombing in Kashmir and the way it's been covered could well affect the outcome of the biggest electoral exercise on the planet. Our starting point this week is India. We begin today on a very disturbing and grief-stricken note. Every time an incident like this happens, uh, before uh, government can respond, before the, uh, you know, the army can respond, the media immediately jumps the gun asking for war. There's two parts to it. One is that the anger which is justified, the demand for justice. All of us are left trying to figure out what is the next step that should be taken. But this narrative then evolves into a call for war against Pakistan. India wants Pakistan punished. And like you, I also want Pakistan punished. There is no denying where the demand for justice comes from, or the news value of the story. On the 14th of February, an SUV packed with explosives rammed into a convoy carrying Indian soldiers and detonated. It was the deadliest peacetime attack on the armed forces since India won its independence in 1947. The coverage on 24-hour news channels has been wall-to-wall, -wall, which is editorially defensible, but descends into unjournalistic ranting, especially during prime time. There are anchors calling for war. Studios populated with former generals talking military tactics. Because for the Indian news media, this story ticks so many boxes. Kashmir, Pakistan, the army, and the attack came just as campaigning begins for a national election that is just months away. The attack has provoked a kind of, um, first of all, a national outpouring of grief on mainstream media channels and the spewing of lots of venom against various targets, particularly against Pakistan, but also against Kashmiris. There's been a jump to assume who is responsible, to make people collectively responsible, and this is the case on many English language and vernacular channels. With the exception of a few sane voices, what you have is a completely absurd uh, and very dangerous competitive jingoism that's perennially on display from all these anchors. India is demanding justice, accountability. The anchors uh, actually play a pretty, pretty strong role in shaping public opinion. And in the present moment, their reaction is, is all the more dangerous. What makes Indian news channels unique is that there are so many of them, far more than any other country. India's media boom began in 1998, and news channels have since seen growth that is exponential. Indians can watch national news channels, regional ones, vernacular channels in various languages, more than 400 in all, pumping out coverage 24-7. The competition for viewers has an intensity like nowhere else. Many anchors feel the need to shout louder, more radically, just to be heard, seen, and clicked upon. And as political debate in India has grown more polarized, often over Prime Minister Modi's brand of Hindu nationalism, TV output has grown more debased. When that kind of coverage is fed into the Indian social media messaging machine, the effect can be dangerous. One of the anchors on, on a very popular debate, a prime time debate, actually said that You are either for or against the nation. 
you will be marked out if you're against the nation. And that's the same kind of rhetoric that I'm also noticing on social media. So it's interesting how social media and television have actually, you know, at least some news channels have actually been hand in hand when it comes to setting the narrative for the current mood. The Hindu right itself, more broadly, but the BJP as a political party has been very, very effective in using the internet in general and social media in particular. What they've basically done is they have very quickly kind of mobilized their forces to essentially see if they can actually hammer it into kind of their classic narrative of Hindus versus Muslims, the Muslim as the figure of the outsider, the Congress as a weak party, liberals as uh, uh, you know anti-national traitors and so on. When that narrative takes on a visual form, it looks like this. On the left is the suicide bomber responsible for the attack in Kashmir. On the right, Rahul Gandhi, the Congress party leader running against Prime Minister Modi's BJP. It's a Photoshop job and a crude one, but it's made the rounds on social media designed to reinforce the notion that Congress is soft on Kashmir, terrorism, and Muslims in general. And there's the pro-BJP messaging online that offers the flip side of the same basic narrative. Vote for Modi and his party if you don't want terrorists on your doorstep. Among the most disturbing social media material now being spread, the calls for attacks on Kashmiris living outside of Kashmir, many of them studying in cities to the south. You've got things like share chat. It's something similar to WhatsApp, but it's huge. Uh, and you've also got TikTok. You can make a 15 second video and in these 15 second videos people have been saying come on let's go out and get them. The uh, single most uh, disturbing aspect is the attacks on Kashmiri students. These attacks have been fanned by this kind of hysteria. Ironically it's a government sponsored scheme which is meant to draw Kashmiri students uh, into the so-called mainstream of India. But these are the students who are now being attacked. Between WhatsApp, TikTok, ShareChat, Line and Hike, India is awash with social media and messaging apps. There are 200 million users on WhatsApp alone, making the country the app's largest domestic market. And when WhatsApp changed its rules recently, placing new limits on the forwarding of group messages, it did so after first field testing those changes in India an implicit admission of the social and political problems WhatsApp has exacerbated there. With elections coming and the BJP leading the way, all parties now want to make the most of the apps at their disposal. And they're doing so without voters necessarily realizing they're being played, whose messages they're reading. It's very difficult to track down who really is making these WhatsApp groups or who really is running these WhatsApp groups, you know, because apart from that one number that you have, you know, of the administrator, you don't really have too much of other information about who these people are. Some of these groups are run by party sympathizers, sometimes uh, staff associated with leaders of different political parties, in a way, sort of supervising what happens in this group. But the two big national parties, um, the Congress and the BJP, have both very actively made efforts to try and grow their base on WhatsApp. WhatsApp has become really, really crucial, but it's only crucial in a particular context. And that context is a mainstream media which does not always do the job that it should be doing, partly through fear, partly through pressure, and partly through political allegiance. And so if we had fewer fake stories making it through mainstream media, then the role that WhatsApp played would be far less. It isn't just that one exists as a parallel universe to the other. It's a symbiotic relationship.